Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Caitlin Elliott, and I cover true crime cases on Tuesdays and Fridays, with my more vintage cases being posted on Fridays. If this is something that interests you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so that you never miss a single one of my videos. And so, in my last video, we covered the case of Lil Brenda Sue Brown, which was an extremely heartbreaking case. And I'm going to be covering another case that not a lot of people know about, and this is going to be the case of Melissa Brannon. Melissa Brannon was the only child of Tammy Brannon and her unnamed ex-husband. And she was born on April 13th of 1984, making her only five years old when she vanished. On December 3rd of 1989, the Woodside Apartment Complex in Lorton, Virginia had a Christmas party where five-year-old little Melissa and her family were in attendance. The Woodside comp Apartment Complex is a very vast network of apartments, and this was just covering most of the land around that surrounded the apartments. And it's said that even though it was a very vast and huge apartment complex. Everybody knew each other and they were all very friendly towards each other. And the apartment complex was also said to have been catered a lot towards children and they did a lot for the children. So they used to have like Easter egg hunts, they would do uh, little Christmas celebrations. And what we're gonna be talking about today is a Christmas party that a lot of families went to attend. As it started to get late, Melissa, um, Melissa's mother, Tammy, she decided that she was going to go um, to the Christmas party. So she went out to make some friends and she and her five-year-old daughter named Melissa went to the party to celebrate Christmas. As it started to get late, Tammy paused to talk to one of her friends before leaving the party. Little Melissa starts to ask her mother, Tammy, if she can go and pick up some potato chips before they left. And Tammy, she said, yeah, you can go pick some up. So Tammy, she agreed and Melissa left. She went to go take some chips with her in a little bowl or a little bag. And this was said to have been the very last time that Melissa Brandon was ever seen. Her mother named Tammy decided she was going to glance over for a quick second while talking to her friend and she noticed her daughter talking to this strange man and you know at the time you know it didn't she didn't really think anything of it which I mean if it was my child I really would have been a little concerned that someone was talking to my child like that especially at the age of four and this man was said to have been in his 30s as well. Tammy turns away for another brief moment to continue her conversation and as she turns back around, Melissa and this man were gone. The most bizarre thing about the uh, thing about the whole disappearance was that Tammy had only lost sight of Melissa for just a few seconds and noticed that she was just gone. Tammy started frantically asking all the residents at the apartment complex party if anyone had seen Melissa, but no one had claimed to have seen her. The Fairfield County uh, Police Department were called immediately. And this became increasingly obvious that Melissa was, in fact, unfortunately missing. Richard Rappaport, the search commander for the local police in Fairfield County, Virginia, ended up joining the case to cover the little girl. One of the theories that the police had at the time was that she had just left the apartment complex. She was just playing with some friends, you know, and she was just lost track of time. So she, the, the police, they ended up, searching the immediate area around the building, hoping that she had just gotten lost in the woods and she had just been playing hide and seek with the children. But unfortunately, you know, they realized that it had been extremely cold that night because Virginia, you know, around the DC area gets a lot of snow. And the detectives theorized that if Melissa did in fact get lost in the woods, there was no way she could have survived the cold that night because it was just freezing outside. Nearly 100 neighbors, police officers, and even members of the United States National Guard began searching for her and were almost certain that they were going to find a little terrified little girl lost in the woods. The authorities began to question the 200 plus party attendees that night about Melissa's disappearance and many residents knew her as a very shy young girl. So whenever they heard that she had been missing, 
it was sh shocked them because she was never one to have been known to speak to strangers. Detective Wilden left with Tammy to interview her about Melissa's disappearance back at the apartment. She was questioned about her past to see whether anything had happened that could have been connected to Melissa's disappearance. Maybe she had an enemy that wanted to take something out on her. But unfortunately, nothing ever came from this because she didn't have any issues with her neighbors. She didn't have any issues really with her ex-husband because she was recently divorced and she moved from Texas to Virginia. And they were on good terms, but the police never even found found out that he didn't even know that Melissa was even missing or had been abducted until afterwards. So while searching the apartment complex for clues, authorities discovered an open window in the furnace room. They were extremely puzzled that no one had told them about this window because it's quite possible the police hadn't even searched it. You know, the detectives came in and were just like, um, what is going on? Like, no one probably even knew that the window was open at that time. The only way in and out of the apartment complex was through the, ma the main front doors of the building. So the fact that this window was open was extremely bizarre. So when searching the bathroom, authorities believe this was the one way that, that Melissa was able to leave with her abductor that night because no one had seen them leave. So it's a possibility he took her into the bathroom and just left. The search for a missing the missing child now became the, a possible abduction case. A child... With child abduction cases, I've talked about this before with my poly class video, it's very critical that um, when it comes to abduct abduction of young children by strangers, that time is of the essence. You have to s start searching for this child as soon as possible because most children, when taken by a stranger or even by a family member sometimes, are harmed within the first 24 hours of the abduction. Authorities questioned the residents even more to figure out, like, a possible suspect that who could have done this to little Melissa. And a lot of people bring up the complex's maintenance man and how he was acting extremely suspicious the night that Melissa Brandon had gone missing. There was a man named Caleb Hughes, and he worked at the apartment complex as a maintenance man, and he had a very bizarre behavior and was ex made extremely vulgar comments towards the women at the complex. And this wasn't just at the party. I mean, this was constantly, he was constantly saying we like weird, vulgar stuff towards the women. Police and detectives wanted to find Melissa as soon as possible because it seemed like if this guy did take Melissa, that her life could be in danger. So, detectives arrived at Tammy's house to collect nightgowns and toothbrushes, just anything that they could find that had D uh, Melissa's scent or DNA on it. As more detectives question the residents of the area, they are informed of even more disturbing behaviors of Caleb's. Apparently, it was said that he spent a lot of time, and I mean like a lot of time, with the young children of the apartment complex. And he even went so far as to even touch the children and try to hold them on his lap where he would like stroke their hair and rub their back. It's just, it's disgusting if you think about it. So, parents really start getting a really uncomfortable feeling about him while at that Christmas party that night. He had shown up to the party that day in his work clothes, which isn't exactly, you know, too, you know, bizarre because he could have just gotten off of work and gone to the party, but it was said that everyone else was dressed, like, extremely nice and he was there in his work clothes, so this was really suspicious. It was said that Caleb had actually talked to Melissa's mother, Tammy, that night and even offered the parents, including Tammy, if he could take their children to the bathroom. I, I don't know about any of y'all, though, but, like, if I had, like, a strange man walk up to me with my children, I don't even have children yet, but if I had children and a strange man walked up and said, hey, you mind if I take your kids to the bathroom? You know, that's just really weird. That's really gross, really weird, and ugh, just so uncomfortable. So, the lead, de like, the lead detective tried to call Caleb Hughes about Melissa's disappearance, but when no one answered, he decided to just travel to Caleb's Hugh Caleb Hughes' house himself and just talk to him. Caleb's wife answered the door, and she was just surprised and had no information about his whereabouts that she could provide to the authorities. I mean, it is possible she knew where he was, but he wanted, she just wanted to uh, keep him hidden and 
not tell anybody, but, you know, it, it could also be the fact that she really just didn't know. So, it actually ended up taking the police two and a half hours hours to get a hold of him which was really weird because he only lived four miles away from the park from where the party had taken place so he arrived home two and a half hours after melissa went missing and he had called the police about you know hey you were at my house you know what's what's up what's going on and the local police questioned him about her disappearance and why he had arrived home so late that night so his excuse was that he wanted to take home the scenic route. Yeah, he wanted to take home the scenic route home, which made authorities really suspicious. Like, why would you want to take home the scenic route? Like, you only live like five minutes away. What's going on? Authorities then realized that he was wearing different clothing than what he had been said to have been wearing at the party. And they asked him, you know, why did you change your clothes? Caleb claimed that he was just washing them in the washing machine because they were dirty and he just needed to get them clean for his next day at work. So when detectives look inside of his washing machine, they notice that they found, like, his clothes are in there, his belt, his shoes. I don't even know who put, like, why would you put shoes in a washing machine, but... However, upon further inspection, they also realized that the knife that had been attached to his clothes... The, there was just a sheath, but the knife itself was missing. So they were just like, mm, it's suspicious. Very suspicious. So he had come home in the middle of the night, stripped down all of his work clothes, including his shoes, and just washed everything. Police and investigators found this information to be extremely bizarre and suspicious because, like I said, he just strips down all their clothes, even the shoes, tosses them in there. And this just increases their interest in his whereabouts even more. Caleb seemed to be extremely uncomfortable to be questioned by the police in front of his wife, so the police ended up taking him down to the local station so he could be questioned privately. When asked, Caleb, he had no alibi for that day. He just was honest. He's like, I have no alibi. And he said he had no idea who Melissa was, nor that she w there was even a missing child in the complex, which had to have been lies. He claimed that he had picked up a six-pack of beer that day before driving home the extremely long route instead of taking the short route home. And he decided he was just going to wash all of his clothes they've been wearing that day, including his shoes, and just call it a day. He said he needed his work clothes to be nice and clean for the next day at work, and they were just dirty and gross, and he didn't want that. So he refused to actually answer any questions about Melissa, just kept dodging even talking about her, didn't even bring up her name, claimed uh, plain that he didn't even know who she was. And after a while, he started getting really annoyed with the questions, and he refused to answer any more. The detectives allowed him to leave the station since they really didn't, they really couldn't do anything else since he wasn't going to answer the questions. But they felt like Caleb was actually lying about his involvement in the case. According to the Fairfax County Police, Caleb had to be the prime suspect, and the way he was acting was too suspicious to not be a suspect. Believing that Caleb Hughes was actually involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Walden, he ended up contacting the Fairfax County attorney to provide the information that he had been given. Very quickly, this case turned into, from, it turned from a missing child to a potential homicide case because of some very disturbing and concerning comments that Caleb had actually made regarding the case. It's not sure what exactly he had said to the authorities, but it was enough to make them really concerned and, you know, worried about Melissa's safety at this point. When Bill Wilden questioned Caleb about his whereabouts, you know, that day and saying that he had been possibly involved with what had happened to Melissa, he only said two things. Prove it. Which, honestly, is so bizarre to say, especially if you just said that you weren't even involved in Melissa's disappearance. Why would you say, oh, prove it, you know? Like, that's just so weird to me. So, police started printing out hundreds and hundreds of flyers with Melissa's face on them in hopes that someone may see her and report it to the police. The following morning after her disappearance, the search for Melissa expanded farther down in uh, south to southern part of the state in order to help locate her. In fact, the D.C. National Guard even ended up getting involved to help search for Melissa. 
So they searched along the roads and like along the ra uh, railroad tracks. They searched along the sides of the roads, the ravines. They searched in the woods. They just looked everywhere they could, and but unfortunately, nothing was found. Authorities then discovered that the car that Caleb Hughes had been said to have been driving the day that Melissa went missing was actually his wife's car. And his wife ended up say, uh, uh, saying to authorities that they were allowed to search in the car to find any type of evidence linking him to Melissa's disappearance. The authorities, they started searching every all through the car for fingerprints, blood, fibers for clothing, hair, or even urine. But the only thing found at this point were the fingerprints of Caleb and his wife. Upon looking more into the interior of the car, they realized it was just too cluttered to search. So the investigators had to use this little duct tape to try to pick up evidence. The abduction of Melissa ended up becoming the lead news story in, story in the D.C. metropolitan area with nearly every single news station talking about her disappearance, trying to bring awareness to the case, trying to bring her home. On the tape, it was discovered there was actually red and blue fibers on it. And this was actually matching the red and plaid jacket that Melissa had last been wearing. Investigators claim that due to these findings, they needed to find the little girl right away to check and see if, you know, the, the fibers could match what she was wearing. And there's no way to test the authenticity of these findings since she was not there. So, investigators, they found blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and even the floor mat, which they even found freshly washed blood stains on Caleb's shoes. So he tried to get rid of the evidence at this point. He was trying to eliminate any traces of DNA on him, on his clothes or anything like that. And it ended up being a failure because they still ended up finding some blood on his car and on his shoes. So detectives became very confident that they were going to, able, going to be able to get a confession out of Caleb about what he had done to Melissa. He was then ultimately brought into the police station for a polygraph test led by authorities themselves, but he could, not, he could not provide an explanation for the blood, nor his two hour late arrival home. He was just like, I don't know. I don't know how I got there. So at this point, it's becoming pretty obvious that Caleb was involved in Melissa's disappearance. When asked by detectives if he had killed Melissa, Caleb responded, no. But the polygraph test proved that he had actually lied when he answered that. Police knew he had lied about this because they all knew that he was last seen with Melissa, you know, holding her on his lap, you know, offering to take her to the bathroom. He was at the party and he was seen with her. And authorities were absolutely convinced that at this point that Caleb had actually abducted and harmed little Melissa on the night of her disappearance. Based on all of this evidence, it became very obvious at this point that Caleb had been the one behind her abduction, though Tammy Brannon tried to keep Faith alive that her daughter was going to be returned home with her, and she even left the um, Christmas gifts belonging to Melissa underneath the Christmas tree and undisturbed in case she would return home. There was ultimately a $10,000 reward for any information that could lead to Melissa's safe return, and Tammy and her parents, at this point, they were just devastated by Melissa's disappearance. No one knew why anyone would want to take the poor little girl. No one knew why she was targeted. No one knew what was going on. So tension was in the air as the family patiently waited for just more information from the authorities. Because at this point, they didn't really know anything. Just five months prior to Melissa's abduction, there was a 10-year-old little girl named Rhiannon Rose Gordon, also known as Rosie Gordon. And she was last seen riding her bike in Maryland down by the D.C. metropolitan area. This uh, case, oof, let me just tell you, it was while I was looking into it, it was just, it was horrible. So she had been abducted. She had been essayed. And ultimately murdered before her body ended up being found just a couple days later by someone just walking by. This occurred not far from Lorton, Virginia, which is where Melissa was kidnapped and Rosie's killer had never ever been caught. So at this point, you know, police are probably are uh, starting to think that this killer behind Rosie could have been the one to take Melissa. So 
Rosie's mother, she heard about Melissa's abduction and she rushed over to Melissa's family home to provide them as much support as she possibly could. When the community found out about Melissa's disappearance, they started trying to do whatever they could to support her family. Yellow ribbons were put up around the area everywhere that they could in support of her because yellow was one of her favorite colors. A lot of people really felt sorrow for, you know, Melissa's mother at this point because she was a single mother and she had Melissa as her only child. So it just seemed like that she was absolutely alone at this point and this devastated the entire community and tore them up. Hundreds of people and local volunteers of the areas of the area started putting into this search effort and posting tons and tons of flyers, like thousands of them, around the area with the little girl's face upon it. The community even volunteered to help to assist in the local authorities for the search for Melissa as the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children sent a man named John Gold to aid in the search for her. So John Gold and his partner arrived at Tammy's apartment to try and search for any clues that could lead to Melissa's whereabouts. And they managed to find adult-sized footprints, but never any footprints belonging to a child. Remember, they were going out and searching the area where it was possible that she had gone out of the bathroom window with this guy. So it was just very confusing to them at this point. These footprints led from the building's apartment complex, apartment building's furnace outside into the snow and by the furnace there was actually a wooden rail that had been recently broken so it's not sure why they broke it maybe it was supposed to be used as some type of a weapon you know it was just very bizarre to authorities so they check out the area and they believe that these footprints belonged if this these footprints belonged to the abductor it was possible that he had been carrying melissa at that point so caleb's wife started to give police some very helpful information as to where he you know the little girl might possibly be the wife then told caleb that he needed to stay home but when she would check the mileage of the car just you know he would she would basically say you know they're looking at you as a suspect you need to stay home blah 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 and she would check the mileage in their car and notice that there were 12 extra and random miles that had just been put onto the car for seemingly no reason when she asked caleb you know like where where did you go why are these 12 extra miles on the car he refused to tell her where he had went Obviously, this made the wife extremely suspicious, and she started to try to keep an eye on him to see what he could be up to. Police started a 25-mile search with the National Guard to look for Melissa. Over 500 volunteers showed up for that day to assist with the authorities and the National Guard, which is so incredible to me how many people search for others that they haven't even met just to try and help the community, help the families. That, like, that's so admirable and it's just amazing to me the 500 people were broke up into 100 search teams of about 50 people and they well no five people sorry and they decided they were going to look all over the area for her there were several underwater dive teams as well that were to look into ponds and rivers in case she may have stumbled in and possibly hit her head and drowned each area was broken down into parts that each group were to search along with any evidence that could be located to be marked as uh, for the crime scene investigators. If anyone found any evidence, they would mark it with like a ribbon or a tape or some rocks and they would come back and find it and take it with them. So it, because of all of this going on, they just kept searching and searching and searching to see if they could find anything. But unfortunately, nothing was found and this ended up ending in disappointment because no one could find Melissa at this point because Melissa was still missing it was absolutely impossible to find any type like it was impossible to locate any DNA or to press any charges up against Caleb they could do nothing at this point and it was very frustrating for the police and for the family the lab workers were actually shocked whenever they started uh searching for DNA at how many fibers had actually been located on his passenger seat as there was actually a grand total of 
70 fibers on Caleb's passenger seat in his vehicle, which just blows my mind. The FBI quickly got involved in this case and were in, they started to investigate Caleb Hughes' house. When his name was announced to the public as the prime suspect of the case, the local media started just buzzing all about it and the FBI began an around-the-clock survey on Caleb. Eventually, they were granted a search warrant for his name, uh, for his home, to search for clues in hopes to try and locate Melissa. It was said that he is he stated that his life had been completely ruined by the fact that the FBI and the police and the authorities were all spying on him. He just felt like his life was over, everything was ruined, and he was just devastated. It was said that Caleb actually grew up in a very abusive family home, and because of this, you know, it, he was abused by his father. You know, his him, his father and his mother fought constantly. He was hitting her. And this was said to have caused him to later become a juvenile delinquent of sorts. And he was no stranger to the law. He had a history of abusing alcohol. He was constantly seen drunk at, out in public. As well as an attraction to young children, if you know what I mean. As I've stated before in previous videos... <laughs> If anyone has an attraction towards young children, you are disgusting, you're filth, and you're trash. And it's just, it's disgusting. You're a disgusting person. Caleb was said to spend a lot of free time, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot of free time with young children. With most around 12 or 13, you know, the uh, prepubescent, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, like the puberty type of thing where they start getting the brain. You know what I'm talking about. So... If you sit back and you think about Caleb's history and all that stuff in his past and the fact that he spent a lot of time with young children as like as old as like 12 or 13, you know, it just it's disgusting to think about. It's, it's so disgusting and it's really disturbing. The FBI began to look into the blood stains that were ultimately discovered on his shoes because at this time they still believed that the shoes had the stains that contained blood serum for which there could be a potential connection to the abduction of Melissa. The blood samples were then sent away to the crime lab for DNA analysis to see who could be the owner of the blood. Like who did this blood belong to? There was a candlelight vigil that day for Melissa at the apartment complex she disappeared from that occurred right before Christmas. I think they said it was like December 22nd or 23rd. As more home videos of Melissa were broadcasted on television, the community became very outraged about her disappearance and they just felt a very like a closeness to her and her family because they felt like they knew her through these videos. Shortly after New Year's Day of 1990, a judge in Fairfax, Virginia received a letter from Caleb's probation officer that stated that he had violated his parole, which, you know, that's a big no-no, and this occurred during an auto theft that took place in 1988, so this was a year prior to Melissa going missing. The judge took away Caleb's probation sentence on January 1st of 1990 said you're not longer on probation because now you're going to be arrested and you're going to go to prison. Now that Caleb was finally arrested, police were so thrilled and the FBI would be able to perform DNA and that, like perform more DNA analysis on him. But at this point, you know, her body had still not been located. So all detectives had to go off of at this point was just, you know, the the stuff that they had found and put in through the lab. But eventually there would become a very big break in this case. When investigators searched Caleb's car, they ended up finding black animal furs. And this was on the front seat of the car. These animal furs were on Melissa's nightshirt, the clothes that she had been wearing, you know, it's it just, it blows my mind, you know? <laughs> The hairs were then collected and run through a DNA analysis before realizing that they had, in fact, matched each other. They were linked. They were the same fur. The fur was said to have been rabbit fur, like authentic rabbit fur. So police asked Tammy if she had owned a rabbit fur coat, for which she said yes and had actually worn it the night of the Christmas party. So Melissa's mother brought 
she ended up buying this like one of a kind rabbit fur coat in Germany and a specific color that was said to not even be available in the United States. Like the United States never even heard of this color. So Tammy had been wearing the jacket before preparing to take them back home and it's possible that the fur may have transferred onto Melissa's clothing. As weeks went by with no word, the media attention began to die down and Tammy just was devastated that Melissa was still not home at this point. It was difficult for her to come to terms that her young and only daughter may possibly never come home or if she does come home, she might come back deceased. And detectives wanted to close her case as quickly as possible and just try to find out what could have happened to the poor little girl. So over time, Tammy became extremely depressed because, you know, she missed her only child. And she ended up not being able to go to work because she was so depressed. And she ended up, like, never, never leaving her home, like, becoming a recluse. So she wanted, to, because this was said that she wanted to actually be there at the house whenever they, you know, would find her and bring her home. And she didn't want to miss the opportunity. A detective on the case named Dietrich, his wife mentioned to him that the Big Bird sweater that Melissa had last uh, been seen wearing the day of her abduction was actually sold at J.C. Penney's. And, you know... She ended up going through her house, like through their house, and they found a JCPenney's catalog. She starts flipping through the pages, and she ends up, oh, someone fell outside, ends up finding the exact same sweater that Melissa had been wearing. So, the FBI contacted jc pennies that day and they started to search for the records to see who could have bought the sweaters where it could have came from just any type of information that they could so meanwhile tammy brannon she receives an unexpected phone call from a young man claiming to have been the one who abducted the little girl for ransom saying that he needed seventy five thousand dollars or else he would do something to harm little melissa for some statistics, and I know I've talked about this before, you know, they said that a young child is harmed after an abduction more, okay, so they said that it's, the ch a child is more likely to be harmed within the first 24 hours after the stranger abduction. I'm sorry if I'm getting so distracted. There's a bunch of kids playing outside and they're falling, cracking their heads open. I don't know what's going on out there. I don't, I don't know. So, at this point, the likelihood that Melissa was still alive was, like, slim to none. There was just a chance that her body would have been, would be discovered before they could find her alive. After this call, Tammy's fingers were quivering as she begins to quickly dial her mother and tell her excitedly how Melissa was alive still. Authorities tried to tell her, you know, not to get her hopes up, but, you know, Tammy, she couldn't help herself. She really felt like her child was still alive. Once again, Melissa was front page news at this point, and a lot of people started talking about her again to bring awareness to the case. The lead detective named Detective Wilden, he told Tammy that she needed to do whatever it took to cooperate with the abductors in order to bring Melissa home safely. One wrong move could cause a whole avalanche and just she could end up being harmed. Two young men picked arrived at the meetup spot with the intention to pick up the money while authorities waited, surrounding the young men with a duff that had been carried, a, like they had a duffel bag, they were going to pick up the money. So they were quickly arrested, and it was realized that this was a complete hoax. They had no idea, like, where she was. All they wanted was money, basically. So scientists ended up finding a hair on Melissa's clothes, which was stated to have not been animal hair, but human hair. This hair was said to have been light blonde hair, and this actually matched the type of hair that Melissa had. There was This was actually a huge break at this point, but authorities really needed to find a duplicate of her sweater in order to match the fibers so they could arrest Caleb. This Big Bird sweater was said to have been extremely rare, so rare, in fact, that J.C. Penney's at J.C. Penney actually had to provide authorities with a list of people who had bought the sweater, but the FBI ended up eventually traveling to go and meet them, 
and it was just to see if anyone still had the outfit. They were traveling to find anyone that they could that had bought the outfit. They were looking at receipts. They were trying to find addresses, just pulling up to see if they still had this sweater. Authorities were actually able to locate a family who could provide the sweater for DNA analysis. And the lead detective was shocked to find out that the sweater was not a blue sweater, but was actually a purplish type of sweater, just like what Melissa had last been seen wearing. The fibers were pulled from the sweater in order to do, provide a um, DNA analysis to see if they matched. And this was, in fact, an exact match to the same fibers that had been found in Caleb's car. And, you know, it had to be uh, from Melissa's sweater. There was still not, there was now enough evidence at this point that an abduction had, in fact, occurred and that Melissa, who was the victim, was unfortunately forced into the car and was forced to sit up front in the car, which, you know, at five years old, you're not supposed to sit anywhere except for the back in a booster seat. So the prosecution could now formally proceed with the evidence that Caleb had, in fact, abducted Melissa from the party. And it was said by multiple people that Caleb had tried to flirt with them. And when this failed, he started flirting with young children. Yeah. Yeah, it's so gross. It stated that he started just drinking heavily and he started getting drunk and then he started becoming this monstrous predator. He started just going after these children with, with just strong desires, if you know what I mean. It's just, he wanted to stalk, he started like stalking all the children. And then he ended up seeing Melissa, this blue-eyed, blonde-haired little girl. And he decided that's the one that he wants. So he wanted to warm up, want her to warm up to him, you know, trust him so that he could find the perfect opportunity to snatch her, especially when no one was looking. Once Caleb left the room with Melissa clutching his hand, he had scooped her up into his arms and proceeded out of the building through the open window in the bathroom. He was able to escape outside and place Melissa in the front seat of his car as the clothing fibers showed that she was in fact in the front seat of his car. And the two ended up zooming off quickly from the party without anybody even noticing that Melissa was gone at this point. Police believe that Caleb was in fact a very dangerous child molester and had possibly murdered Melissa the day that she had been kidnapped. The prosecution had to convince the jury that the fibers had in fact come from Melissa's clothes directly and there was no other way for these fibers to be, like, to happen. Like, there's no, they matched each other and it could not match anything else. They had uh, collected as many type of clothes as they could find that were made with the same type of navy blue acrylic sweat, uh, type of material that the sweater was made of. However, none of them matched him except the samples that they had that had come from Caleb's car and sweater. So at this point, as the case is about to go to trial, a vital development would occur and the authorities received a call that a small child's body had actually been found two counties over and police at the time, they thought that this could be the body of Melissa Brannon. Because of this, police believed that the case would ultimately be solved due to the fact that Caleb was very familiar to the area. He took Melissa. It's possible he could have you know, murdered her and buried her body over there. So he could be arrested and charged with her murder if they had a body at this point. But unfortunately, the body did not, in fact, belong to Melissa, but was said to have belonged to a young 12-year-old girl. And the Jane Doe was deceased for a very long time. And unfortunately, to this day, this 12-year-old Jane Doe has never been identified which is just so sad. Like, they find this body while going and searching for this little girl, and this, none of them have been, you know, Melissa has never been found. You know, they had this whole issue with the whole body being found. Like, they, it just, it still has never been identified to this day as who that body could belong to. Caleb Hughes was ultimately arrested for abducting the young girl 
Melissa Brannon and was transferred to the local Fairfax County Jail for his trial, for which he kept trying to push back the date, you know, trying to buy himself some more time and make him seem as innocent as possible, essentially. In Virginia, it is actually considered legal to charge someone with murder if you don't have a body. If there is enough substantial evidence that could say that a murder had actually had taken place. So, Kayla was charged with the crime of abduction with the intent to harm, if you can catch my drift. They said defile, but like that just it's so gross. Tammy just wanted to know what happened to her little girl that dreadful day and whether or not her daughter would end up being found alive at this point. So she just really wanted to know if Melissa was alive, if he did in fact kill Melissa, where did he bury her because she just wanted to bring her child home and give her a proper burial that she deserved. And when it came to Melissa's abduction, it pained Tammy to think that she may never ever receive that closure. The types of cases that are considered solved but no body are always the most frustrating cases to me. And they just, it just frustrates me beyond belief because somebody knows something and they don't wanna say anything. The trial for Melissa Brandon's murder occurred on February 26th of 1991. When it came to the trial, the lead prosecutors wanted to bring up Caleb's disgusting behavior at the Christmas party as the evidence. The witness claimed that he had actually been seen multiple times by multiple people exhibiting sexual-like behaviors towards female party guests and towards the children. They were just fondling the children. He literally was fondling the children. That's so disgusting. It was listed in the... um the trial hearings that he had in fact been seen fondling children. Oh my God. It just disgusts me beyond no point. So she's the witness confirmed this to the police saying, yeah, this happened. I was, you know, you know, flirted with by this guy before he started going after the children. And it was said that Caleb had been seen spending a lot of time that particular evening with little Melissa. I mean, like, a lot of time. They were by each other's sides all the time. He was, had actually been last seen with her on the night of her abduction with his behavior of washing clothes. His, including his shoes, that night w was just extremely suspicious to police at this time. I still can't get over the fact that he actually, like, washed his shoes in the washing machine. Like, that's just... You, no one washes their shoes in a washing machine. Like, that's so weird to me. And the fact that he did that, you know, it just, it, he had to have done something, you know, like, you don't just sit there and wash your shoes in the washing machine. It's, I mean, I wash my pillows sometimes and they explode. You know, that's, you don't do that. The prosecution provided the exact matches found in Caleb's car compared to Melissa, but the defense started saying this was only circumstantial evidence and, you know, it just somehow ended up there. And then they said that it didn't mean anything in the case. Then they tried to say that the FBI had planted it there as, you know, trying to target Caleb. And this seriously just doesn't make any damn sense. Like, how else would they get into the car? It just... She had to have truly had been in that vehicle. Like, there's no other explanation. There's no other way that this could have happened it just none of it makes any sense to me so the prosecution wanted to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that caleb had in fact abducted melissa with the intent of defiling her so they even said that he had removed her coat in the car in december with no heat on like it's freezing outside and uh, it's just Disgusts me beyond no belief. I, the jury, they ultimately found Caleb Hughes guilty of abducting five-year-old Melissa Brandon and defiling her. Ultimately being charged for this and being sent to prison for 50 years. However, not that long ago, on August 2nd of 2019, this was like 30 years, not even 50 years. Like he was sent there for 50 years to life and he didn't even meet the minimum 
sentence before he was released on August 2nd of 2019. And he was told that he had to be made to register as an offender for the rest of his life. And this just, it pisses me off because he should have just stayed in prison and, you know, kept keep that guy behind bars. He just, oh, as you can tell, I'm frustrated. So to this day, Melissa Brannon has never been found. And as I'm recording this on April 19th of 2019, he has never been, like, she has never been found. And her parents have never been able to give her a proper burial. Caleb knows something, but he's out there now living his life. And I mean, it's possible Melissa didn't even get to finish living her life. Like, at this point, you know, I do believe that Caleb did, in fact, kill her. I do. And I hate saying that. But, I mean, he knows something. And, and I don't know if you know about this or not, but when it comes to people who uh, murder others, like, you know, if Caleb did, in fact, murder Melissa, if he doesn't tell authorities where, in fact, her body is, that is used as power. And it gives them power over them because of the police and everything and the families because they know the abductor knows something and he won't tell anyone. It's just so... It just pisses me off so much. I would love to know what you guys think about this case. If you guys think that he should have stayed in prison longer... If you guys think that he actually did kill Melissa, if you guys think Melissa would be found alive, what do you guys think about this case? Do you guys think that she'll ever be found? Do you guys ever really think that she will be found? And let me know what you guys think about him getting out of jail early because that, that just pissed me off. Thank you all so much for listening to this video. And I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. If you guys had a wonderful Easter, make some good choices. Go outside, enjoy the sunshine, the nice spring weather. It's beautiful here in Hawaii. It's, I love it here. It's just always gorgeous. And I hope you guys managed to catch me in my next video on Friday. Make sure you ch hit that like button. Hit that notification bell so you never miss my videos. And I will see you guys in my next one.